Hello, my lovelies. I'm Kelsey Nienna. This is the Orange Lily Project. And today with biblical interpretation, we're going to be talking about worship, specifically how the Jewish people worship the Lord throughout the different periods of the Bible. So at the very beginning of the Jewish and biblical story, during the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these people were wanderers. They were kind of nomads, and so they did not have a permanent place of worship. They would have altars where, that they would raise up, which was basically rocks, and they would anoint it with oil, and they would have sacrifices on it. They would do that, but there was no permanent spot for them, not until the Israelites really began to form as a people. The first really established place of worship for the Israelites was the tabernacle, or the dwelling place of the Lord. It was a very ornate tent that they had built for him, and whenever the Israelites were moving around in the wilderness, this is post-Egypt exile, so they're wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years with Moses and company, whenever they would make camp, they would always put the tabernacle down first, and then build everything around it. That is true with um, homes that were built on top of each other, the father's house would be first, but also with um, armies, the king's tent would be in the center and everyone else would be built around them. So the ornate tent um, had two sections. The first was, you would enter through here, the first was the holy place. It had the table of shoe bread, it had an altar for incense, and then it had a candlestick or a menorah. There would be an ornate veil and then behind it would be the most holy place, later known as the Holy of Holies, and there would be the Ark of the Covenant. Outside the tent, there would be a bit of a courtyard that only the Levites were allowed to enter. There would be the lavar, it was a large washing basin for ritualistic cleaning, and then an altar of burnt offerings. And that was all enclosed in a gate, so no one and nothing would wander in to this place that was holy and set apart. After the tabernacle, then the Levites, specifically from the line of Aaron, Moses' brother, the Levites, they would set their tents around the gate as an extra hedge of protection, and they were the ones who would take care of this holy space. After the Levites, then the inside camp, which would be the 12 tribes of um, Jacob, and then outside the camp would be for the Gentiles, people who believed and worshipped the Lord, but were not um, Israelites themselves, and then the people who were um, unclean, whether short-term or long-term people. And that was the first set-up place of worship. And in terms of the timeline, the tabernacle was set up with the Mosaic Covenant. There are two things that we need to talk about that really go hand in hand. There's the tabernacle, which was the dwelling place of the Lord, his holy tent, but there was also something called the Ark of the Covenant. If you've seen the Indiana Jones movies, you might be a little familiar with the Ark of the Covenant. It was a very ornate box that the Lord had Moses instruct the Israelites to build. So following the Mosaic Covenant, where God gave Moses and the Israelites the Ten Commandments, they were considered to be so holy and important that they shouldn't just be left lying around. So the artists were commissioned to make a special box. And inside this ark, there would be the tablets, which had the Ten Commandments. There would be Moses' brother Aaron, him, his rod, which was which, his staff or rod, which was a symbol of authority. And then they would also collect a jar of manna, the bread from heaven, and they would collect a jar of that. And those three things would be inside the Ark of the Covenant at all times. Now, this box was considered so holy that no mortal man was to touch it. And there are stories in the Bible where if someone did touch it with their skin, they would die because something so dirty cannot touch something so clean and not be harmed by it. And so the box would, had some rings built on either side and long staves would go through them and you would carry it much like uh, pole bearers. And it was only to be carried by the priests or the Levites who was again from the line of Aaron. And wherever the tabernacle went, 
it would be built around the Ark of the Covenant itself. And the Ark was said to be God's throne. He would come and sit between, the Lord's presence would come and sit between the two angels that were built on top of it. Wherever they went, the Ark of the Covenant went first. And if it was a dangerous place, the Ark would go first, and then the people would pass, and the Ark would leave last. So fast forward 40 years, they've been wandering in the wilderness, and at last they're allowed to enter the promised land. Moses has died inside of it. He died with the previous generation, and now Joshua is his successor and in charge. And they've gone through the wilderness. They've been all around here, and they're going through the wilderness. And finally, let's zoom in, they enter the promised land through the Jordan River and land in Jericho. And it talks about in Joshua how the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the Jordan River, it was carried in, and then the waters parted just as it did in Egypt so that the people passed on dry land. So the Ark of the Covenant entered the potentially dangerous water first, entered the Holy Lands first, paused so all of the people could enter, and then once everyone was safely on dry land, the Ark of the Covenant carried on, and then the water moved went back to normal. And then they would wait, the Levites would walk around, get to the front, and then continue to lead the people to where they were meant to go. God's chosen people, the Israelites, they cross the Jordan River on dry ground, they land in Jericho, they run, they walk laps for a week, the walls come down, we meet Rahab, and their numbers grow a little bit. And finally, after a while, they come up north to two mountains that will come into play a little later on in this series, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Again, apologies for the mispronunciations. And while there, Joshua, the new commander, remember, he holds a feast of curses and blessings, and sacrifices of curses is given on Mount Ebal, and blessings is on Mount Gerizim, and they stay there for a little while. It, it's from here that the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle are actually separated for a very long time. The Tabernacle stays and then is moved around for a bit, but the Ark of the Covenant is taken south to near Jerusalem, where it's taken care of in a temple, not the temple that we'll be talking about, but a more permanent temple set up for the Lord, and it's cared for there by the priest Eli, his son, to royally mess things up, and also tended to by Samuel, who is eventually known as a priest, a prophet, and a judge, and it's Samuel who will eventually go on to anoint the first kings of Israel. But Eli's sons took the Ark of the Covenant into battle as a good luck charm. Rather than consult the Ark to see what they should do, rather than giving it the reverence they deserved, it deserved, they treated it like a rabbit's foot, and it was stolen by the Philistines, and it was gone for a very long time. But there, there's a fun story there, the Ark of the Covenant causing absolute mayhem in its captor's care. Um, specifically, people are getting sick, they're breaking out into tumors, and they lay the Ark of the Covenant in the temple of one of their gods, and every morning they get up to tend to their god, and their statue is face down on the floor, laying prostrate to the Ark of the Covenant, and it keeps on happening until one morning they go into the temple, and the head of their god and the hands have been chopped off, which was incidentally what would happen to a king uh, who lost their battle. The head and hands would be cut off, and they're like, oh snap, the Ark of the Covenant did this, we gotta get rid of this. And so they take it and they left it on the outskirts of Israel with offerings of gold depicting the work of the Lord uh, against them. The Ark of the Covenant is found by the Israelites just on the edge of their land, and Saul, who at this point is king, he takes it and sets up the Ark of the Covenant very nearby in the house of Abinadab and his son Eleazar, where it stays for 20 years because there isn't a permanent or suitable dwelling place for the Ark at this time. So fast forward a few more years, 
David is now king. Saul is dead. David has become the new king. And he really wants to build a temple for the Lord. But he's visited by God who says, hey, that's not for you to do. That will be part of your son's tasks. But they do officially move the Ark of the Covenant from the place where it's been staying in someone's home, and they bring it to Jerusalem. They also get the tabernacle from Saul's hometown where it had been kept, and at last the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant are reunited again. Now let's talk about the temple. In the Bible, there are two temples. Solomon's temple, the first temple, and then Herod's temple, the second temple. And much of biblical history can be separated in first temple period and second temple period. Solomon is tasked with building God's holy temple. And if you read about it in Kings, in First Kings, it's this glorious, it takes years and years to make, and things are covered in gold and gems and the best of pines and all this stuff. So let's talk about the structure of Solomon's temple. It is very, very similar to the tabernacle of the Israelites in the wilderness, and that was by design. Only this was much bigger and more elaborate and, of course, was meant to be permanent. So they were able to do certain things that you wouldn't have been able to do if you were expecting to pack up and move again. So you would come up the hill and come up the stairs and you would enter into the great court. And if you were the everyman, the Israel, just the basic Israelite, that is where you would worship. Then, if you were a priest, you could come up the stairs even more and you would meet the brazen altar, which was so big you had to go upstairs to, you know, lay your sacrifices on it. And there was a large washing basin called the brazen sea. And this entire area was called the upper or the inner courts of the priests. Only the priests, specifically Levites from the line of Aaron, were allowed to work in this space. Around the building itself, there were more lavers and bases for ritualistic washing. And if you were to enter into the holy place, you would pass through the two pillars of Jachin and Boaz. You would enter the holy place, which had the same layout as the tabernacle for the Israelites in the wilderness, only it was bigger, more glorious, and had more stuff. So instead of one can stick, you would have ten menorahs. Instead of one table of the presents or the showbread, you had ten. There was an altar of incense. Again, there would be a very ornate veil concealing the Holy of Holies. And inside, if you were the head priest on the Day of Atonement, you would see and no one else would see the two statues of angels or cherubim. And in the center was the Ark of the Covenant. We've already touched base on this in the geography video, but a bit of a review. Eventually the Babylonians, well the Assyrians come up and start taking over, and Egypt's down here taking over, and then after Assyria, the Babylonians come over and start taking over things, and when the Babylonians came, they burned the temple to the ground and looted everything. And here's where it gets interesting. To this day, we don't know where the Ark of the Covenant is. Indiana Jones did not find it in a pit surrounded by snakes. We don't know what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. And currently there are three primary theories. The first is that in anticipation of this attack, this invasion, it was hidden away somewhere in the Temple Mount itself. It's a pretty big hill. It could have been buried or there was a cave or something. That's one of the theories, that it was tucked away close by so no one could find it. But then with the invasion, the people who knew where it was were killed or taken to Babylon. Another theory is, again, in anticipation of the invasion, the Ark of the Covenant was removed entirely from Mount Zion and hidden away somewhere else. And again, the people who knew where it was died. And then the third possibility, the third theory, is that it was taken by the Babylonians as one more bit of loot and spoils and one more thing to kind of hold over people's heads. What do I think? I... Mm, I think it was more likely hidden away given, you know, the kind of chaos the Ark of the Covenant generally caused whenever it was taken by people it didn't want to be taken by. That's not canon, that's a personal Kelsey theory, that's 
neither here nor there. So if you can, for a moment, we're going to step inside the story a bit more and try to imagine how it would have been. You have been captured, your home has been destroyed, and you are being carted off by the Babylonians, and you don't know if you're going to be killed along the way, you don't know if you're going to become a slave, you don't know if you're going to be acclimated into the culture. You're going to be acclimated into the culture, but behind you, the smoke of the temple is rising up like a pillar. The jewel of the entire land is being burned to the ground, and the Ark of the Covenant is nowhere to be seen, and it's never going to be seen again. This is so much of their identity. They had once been slaves, and then they were given a land of their own, and the Lord dwelt among them, and they built a, a temple for him, and now the land has been taken over. They're being carted off in shackles as slaves again, and the dwelling place of the Lord is up in smoke, and you have no idea what's going to happen next. So fast forward, the Babylonians have been taken over by the Persians, and Nehemiah, who is a Jewish man raised in this captivity, he has found favor with the Persian king. He works in the courts, and he has been given permission to go back to the land of his forefathers, back to Israel, and rebuild the temple. And so he and a bunch of workers, they come back, and during the time of the exile, they wrote down much of the Old Testament that we have today. They had the Torah and the Nevi'im and much of the Ketuvim, and they've written it all down. And so for the first real time, really, they've got their entire um, Tanakh, their entire holy word written down in one place. And so they come back down, and they start building building, rebuilding the temple. Now, this begins the second temple period. Solomon's temple was the first temple period, because it was the first one. And then we get to the second temple period. And here's where it gets a little bit confusing if you don't know the history. In the New Testament, we hear about Herod's temple that he built for the Jews. And it's the same temple um, sort of. Nehemiah and the Israelites start building the temple, and then, you know, however many years later, Herod starts to build and expand on their original structure. And because the temple never had to close down, that was part of the condition for them to, you know, let him do the extra construction without putting up a fight. So long as they were able to continue doing their worship and their sacrifices, etc., then they were okay with him expanding and building on the second temple. And so because there was no end time of the second temple and new beginning time of Herod's temple, it's considered the same thing. So for the second temple slash Herod's temple, I'm going to zoom in first. Um, the the center structure is very similar to the tabernacle and Solomon's temple, again by design. You would enter into the courts of priests if you were a priest, and there would be a big honking altar and a, a laver, a washing basin. There'd be a place for slaughtering the animals before sacrificing. There'd be a porch that you'd enter, and then the holy place, and then a large ornate veil and the holy of holies. And to their everlasting grief, the Ark of the Covenant was never found. So it was still thought that the presence of the Lord was there, but they knew that the Ark of the Covenant itself, with the Ten Commandments inside, with Aaron's rod inside, with the manna inside, that was lost. But the area of the Holy of Holies was still revered. So zoom out where Solomon's great court was, now was the court of Israel, and that is where the Jewish men would worship, and only the men. Go down the stairs, and then you would have the court of women, with only the women. Then you had a couple little chambers, and they were all open spaces. So there was the chamber of lepers, the chamber of wood, chamber of oils, chamber of Nazarites. Go down some stairs, there would be a sacred enclosure, which was sort of just one more separation between the Israelites and the Gentiles. And then you would have the court of Gentiles. Now, when we think of a temple or a church, you probably have an idea of how big or small it is. The church I'm filming in right now that I worship in is considered a fairly large building and we're ever expanding because we keep outgrowing ourselves. To give you an idea about size, Solomon's temple was thought to be about 17 square acres. 
Herod's temple was 36, so it was more than double in size. And in terms of length, the court of Gentiles itself was said to be about half a mile long. So, big. Time for biblical interpretation snippet to send you on your way. Let's talk about houses. When doing biblical interpretation, it's actually really, really helpful to understand how the houses were built and how the cities were built. Because otherwise, a bunch of stories are either going to lose their richness or not really make a lot of sense at all. Case in point, in the book of Judges, there's a man called Jephthah, who is a commander and an army for the Lord. And he tells God, hey, if you will lead our people to victory and you allow me to come home safely, then the first thing that comes out of my house, that will be yours and I will burn it as a sacrifice to you as a thank you. And he is victorious and he gets home and coming out of the house, the first thing he sees is his daughter singing and dancing and celebrating his victory. And he's like, no, how could this happen? And we're probably reading that thinking, well, why would you promise God to kill the first thing that came out of your house? Who did you think it would be, your wife? And if we look at the houses in the modern way, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So let's take a look at how an ancient Jewish home was built. So a Jewish house would typically be roughly two floors. It would be on a hard surface. Remember the man who built his house on a rock? Well, it wasn't just to keep it steady from storms. It was also for easy cleaning so that you could toss a bucket of water and get rid of the filth and excrement on the floor because the first floor would have been a sort of stable. Now you wouldn't have kept your flocks in there, there wouldn't have been enough room. What you would have done is you would have kept the animals that you were specifically raising for sacrifice for God, for various atonements and thanksgivings. And there it would be, you know, fenced off and they would eat from their feeding troughs, also known as mangers, and then the family living space would be the floor above because he would rise in the cold of night and sometimes there would be a spare room in the back and in the stone floor there would also be a drain so you could toss the water and send it out that way like its own sewage system. And so understanding that, when Jephthah is promising the Lord the first thing that comes out of my home will be a sacrifice, he's saying that because the first floor is where the sacrificial animals live. That's what he expected to come out. But it's also, funnily enough, the story of Jephthah and his daughter is also a really great example of how people back then didn't do proper biblical interpretation. If he had known the law better, if he had known the character of God better, he would have remembered the story of Abraham and Isaac and how God didn't want children to be sacrificed. It's more a mark of how far the people have fallen that he thinks God would really want him to do it to his daughter. The character of God suggests that if Jephthah had said, you know I meant an animal, God would have forgiven him, but he and the people around him are so used to the surrounding cultures, they don't believe that there's a merciful God, only one who wants retribution and all these, you know, promises to be fulfilled no matter who suffers because of them. So. They were biblically misinterpreting things themselves. Another thing that comes up often is, in my father's house are many what? In John 14, Jesus says, in my father's house there are many rooms, mansions, dwellings. What is it? Well, if you know how a Jewish house would have been built back then, before the Romans started doing road systems and everything for everyone, you'd understand that the answer is yes to all those words. The father's house, um, the, the, the cornerstone of the house would be for the head patriarch, the father. And this would be the father's house. And we're going to do a nice F to symbolize the father. And then the son would get married and they would build him a house attached to the father's house. And then the next child gets married, and they add a house, 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 and now cousins, and yay, and all this stuff. And all of them are connected to the father's house. These are rooms, these are mansions, these are dwellings. And that is what the Jewish people would have understood back then, as Jesus was telling them. And one of the things that we can start, you know, taking this biblical interpretation and systematically applying it, remember what does it have to do with our life, 
Jesus is saying, you know, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go on ahead to prepare a place for you. In adapting us into his family and telling us that he is preparing a place for us with God the Father as the cornerstone, as the beginning house structure, he's adding us onto his family and the, the dwelling so we can live close to God at all times. Now, in addition to being built like that as an ever-growing family pod, in cities, houses were also the wall. So in Joshua, we meet a woman named Rahab. She's a prostitute, and it says her house was built into the city wall. Now, we understand walls to be maybe this thick at most, or a little wall, and you're like, how would a house, is it just sticking out? Is it just pushed against it? Understanding how things were built back then, the architecture would show you that the houses were the wall, and it would be very similar structures, like so. The further, um, further away from society socially you were, the likelier, the farther out you would be until if you were kind of the bottom of the food chain but still had a home, you would be the wall itself. And part of that was because um, in the event of an invasion, the people who were less cared for, they would be the first ones to go. And Rahab, who was a prostitute and very much on the outskirts of the city, she would have definitely been someone, you know, closer to the danger. And interestingly enough, later on, we're going to be looking at David when he's in his palace and he looks out and sees a woman named Bathsheba bathing. And we find out that she is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And we can already get a pretty good idea just on how, um, look, how the layout works that David and Uriah the Hittite knew each other and Uriah the Hittite was well regarded if the house that Bathsheba was living and bathing in was so close to the palace that David was able to spy on her. And if you look through the life and times of David, you'll find out that Uriah was one of 37 mighty soldiers and you know very trusted and loyal to the king. One final note about houses. As we said already, the bottom floor of a house would have been set aside as a stable for animals that were being raised for slaughter for sacrifices unto the Lord. And they would eat from a feeding trough called a manger. And if you've been raised in the church, hearing the word manger already brings to mind a certain image of a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn, spare room. We can talk about language later, but the point is understanding the structure of a house not only can make entire you know, passages make a whole lot more sense, but it adds an added richness that we wouldn't have otherwise known before because Jesus, you know, the son of God, who instead of Isaac having to be sacrificed and God supplying a ram, instead of us having to be sacrificed, God is supplying a son, his only son whom he loves. And the first night he ever spends on earth, it's not in a palace, it's not in a guest room, it's in the manger on the first floor with the other animals that are being raised for slaughter. That is why Jesus came and the first night on earth is showing that it was very intentional. Now, are these little bits of tidbit information completely vital for our salvation? No, not really. Does it help us understand the bigger picture and by doing so make the Bible so much more cool? Well, yeah! The final place of worship that we want to talk about were synagogues. And unlike the temple, unlike the tabernacle, it wasn't just a holy place. This was a communal place for the Jews to come together to, for assembly, to worship, and to study. And so there would be teachings there. And men and women were allowed to enter them. Now, depending on the town itself, that could dictate a bit about how the synagogue itself was built. For example, if it was a Jewish town, then the synagogue would be in the middle, like the tabernacle, like the temple, like the father's house, and the town would be built up around it, so it would be the center. But if it was in a mixed town, then you kind of put it wherever you were able to. 
And because they wanted the building to be different from the others around them, it would be a bit bigger, they would try to use different materials, so visually it would stand out. But the layout itself could vary from synagogue to synagogue because for some they started out in people's homes and they would be built on like the houses that we've talked about and other times it would be its own independent structure. But the inside of the synagogue followed certain structures that were generally universal. So you would have your You would have your space and you would enter it and there would be seats all along the walls so you could sit and assemble or study and what have you and outside the courtyard if there was a courtyard there might be a place where you could wash there could be some storage areas generally very much like the temple, but it was also convenient. You need to keep things there and you wouldn't keep it in the teaching space. You would have a table where you could do your readings on. There would be something that was called the Ark of the Torah. Now remember, the Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And inside the Ark of the Covenant was Aaron's rod, a jar of manna, and then the Ten Commandments itself from the stones. But for a synagogue, it would have the Ark of the Torah. It would be a box or a cabinet uh, where only the Torah was kept. The, just the, um, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And it would be there. And somewhere around here, sometimes the table, sometimes on the side, somewhere would be something called the Mashe or Moses' seat, where when you sat in it, well, actually, we'll, we'll do blue to show that it could be in a couple places. Wherever Moses' seat was, that is where you would read the Torah from. And then you would stand up and do your teaching. And one of the ways we know this is in the Bible, Jesus talks about the Pharisees and Sadducees and says, when they're seated on Moses' seat, you can listen to them because they're reading directly from the Torah. They're not adding their own commentary. But when they stand up, be wary of what they say. On the topic of Pharisees and Sadducees, if you're anything like me growing up, I could not figure out the difference between the two. They are both, they, they don't like Jesus. Is there anything more to know? Yes, there is. So Pharisees and Sadducees had a number of differences, but here were some of the primary ones. And reading through the New Testament again, you'll be able to start reading when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees or the Sadducees and understanding why they would get so ticked off. So the Pharisees, they believed that the center, the center of their faith was around the Torah the, or the Pentateuch, the five books of the law. The Sadducees believed that the center was in the temple. So the Pharisees were very emphatic about making the Torah and you know, following the law of God into everything they did and to such an extent that not only did they follow the law, but they upped the rules and so they were following it to the nth degree for example on the day of atonement you only had to fast the one day for 25 hours and that was the only day that everyone was called to fast pharisees fasted twice a week on mondays and thursdays every week and everybody knew it while the pharisees were obsessed with making every element of their life centered around the Torah. Meanwhile, the Sadducees were more about political power. They collaborated with the Romans to keep the peace, and in return, they were allowed to do what they wanted in the temple, and they were able to just generally rule over the Jews in a new layer. The next big difference is what they considered the Holy Scriptures. The Pharisees read the entire Tanakh, the Torah, the Nehavim, and the Ketavim, whereas the Sadducees only acknowledged the first five books of the Bible. And incidentally, that was the same for the Samaritans, but for different reasons. So understanding what the different groups believed helped us understand the run-ins Jesus had with them and why these people got so upset. 
while the Pharisees were so protective of the Sabbath, they added rules where you couldn't walk a certain number of steps, you couldn't dress a certain number of ways, you couldn't cook, you couldn't do all these various different things lest you break the Sabbath. Meanwhile, Jesus not only is doing these things, but he's also healing people. Of course the Pharisees are upset. Similarly, they didn't believe in angels or demons, and yet Jesus is casting them out. With the angels and demons, the Sadducees did believe in angels and demons, but that only God could cast them out. And Jesus is saying, I'm God's son and I'm the Messiah. The Sadducees didn't believe in a Messiah, only, you know, God who could not be the Messiah, so he, it's a double whammy. Meanwhile, the Pharisees are waiting for the Messiah to come. Jesus says, hey, guess what? It's me. Of course they're getting ticked off. Another interesting difference was concerning the resurrection. The Pharisees believed in the eventual resurrection of the dead, meaning God's chosen people. The Sadducees didn't, and this gets a little interesting. So eventually, when they go to Jesus, there's a story of them going to him and creating this scenario where a woman has married a man and a man dies. And according to their laws at the time, if the husband died and there were no children to carry on his name, if his brother was unmarried, he would marry the woman so she could bear a son to carry on the firstborn's name. And on it goes. And so after she's been widowed X number of times from these brothers, the Sadducees say in the resurrection, who will she be married to? And Jesus, well, they're bringing this up. They're, they're creating a scenario that they already do not believe is true. They don't believe in a resurrection. And so whatever answer Jesus gives, they're ready to get him, saying, ah, you don't know our laws, you don't know the rules, you're dumb, stupid, whatever. But Jesus, in all of these interactions with the Sadducees and Pharisees, he knows what they're doing, he knows they're clever, but he is wiser. He's everything er. And he flips it on his head and he starts talking about Moses. Now, the Sadducees, remember, they only saw the Torah as authoritative, only the first five books. And so Jesus is speaking to them only referencing the books that they acknowledge as true law. And so he starts talking about Moses, who uh, is generally thought wrote down the Torah. And so he is talking about Moses and how when God met Moses, he identified himself as I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I am their God. That's present tense. He can't be presently God of, some, of somebody who's dead and no longer exists like the Sadducees thought. If there's no resurrection, then Abraham, his bones are to the dust and it's gone and there's no more Abraham anymore. But in the books that they acknowledge as canon and authoritative, Jesus is reminding them that God has already identified himself as the God of the living and the people who will be resurrected. That's the only way he can identify himself as present tense, the God of these people who are long dead gone. The final rules we're going to very briefly touch base on today in terms of holy leaders were more in the temple. So we had the Sadducees who kind of ran the temple. There were also the chief priests. There were the elders. There was the Jerusalem wealthy. And then there were the scribes. They were the recorders, they were the teachers, they were the lawyers. So if a character is brought up to Jesus as a lawyer, he was probably a scribe. If he was brought up as a scribe, he was a teacher. He was someone who understood the law. These words can be used interchangeably. Scribe, teacher of the law, lawyer. So as all these people are coming forward to Jesus asking all these questions, we're able to understand, ah, these people are coming on behalf of the temple, and these people are coming on behalf of the home, where the Torah is the center, where the temple is the center. But the problem with both of these is neither of the center was God. Neither of them were honoring Jesus. Well, clearly not Jesus the most, but neither of them were honoring God the most. They were putting their claim on a place and a thing. So when Jesus showed up and started saying how he was the way, the truth, and the life, he was the Messiah, he was 
God's son, naturally, it messed up their world. They couldn't believe it. Time for a biblical interpretation snippet to send you on your way. Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Good Samaritan. So Jesus tells a story of a man who is on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho. Do, 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 do. Now the Sadducees believed to touch a dead body would defile them and they would become unpure. Pharisees did not believe that. And both were not supposed to touch anyone bloody, but there was a caveat there where if it was to save somebody's life, you could touch them and you could get them to safety. It would have been fine. But Jesus is setting up the story in such a way that the priest and the Levite, the Pharisee and the Sadducee in the story, they could have helped this man if they wanted to. He was left for dead, but he wasn't dead yet. And this is just one more way that Jesus is kind of low-key exposing their hardened hearts and their own personal agenda that passing this man who they are in the power to help and can help and are encouraged to help, they refuse to do it. Now, is this little snippet vital for our salvation? No, not really. Does it help us understand the Bible at large and make it so much cooler? Hope. Yeah, 